In chapter 16, we will be looking at a special type of organic molecules that are known as amines. So we'll study the chemistry of amines in this chapter. So, let us see what will be covered. So first, we will look at the functional group of the amine. Look at the structure, and then we will classify amines into different groups. As we have learned earlier, whenever you have a lot of information, it's best to classify them into subcategories and study each of these categories. So there are quite a number of amines that are found in nature, as you'll see in this lecture. So, but we can classify them based on their structure. Next, we will look at the nomenclature of amines. How do we name amines so that chemists and, and, and scientists all over the world will know the exact name that we're talking about. Next, we will look at the properties of amines. Of course, as you know, the properties of compounds are basically um, characteristics that are measurable and observable. These are very important in terms of um, identifying um, um, biological or chemical compounds. Next, we will look at the application of properties um, of a means in everyday life. So let's begin. A means. So they have the nitrogen atom. So remember again that organic chemistry is the study of compounds which have carbons and hydrogens, basically. But these compounds also have heteroatoms, or hetero here means different. So it's different from carbon and hydrogens. So for means the atoms that are, well the atom in this case, which is the heteroatom, is nitrogen. So, the classification is, here is a nitrogen, and of course as you remember from your Gen Chem course, nitrogen has three bonds to it, one, two, and three bonds to nitrogen. If these are bonded to hydrogen, or if it has three hydrogens, this molecule is known as ammonia. So that is a specific molecule which has nitrogen and three hydrogens bonded to that nitrogen. If, however, there is an alkyl group, we, which we defined as R, we call that a carbon-containing alkyl group. If it's one alkyl group and two hydrogens, this type of amine is known as a primary amine. And of course, you know the symbol is one superscript zero for primary amine because it has just one alkyl group or carbon-containing group bonded to the nitrogen. As you can imagine, if there are two, one, two alkyl carbon-containing groups bonded to the nitrogen, it's a secondary amine. So that's a classification, a secondary amine to superscript zero. And as you can imagine, if there are three, one, two, and three that are bonded to this nitrogen here, that amine would be classified as a tertiary amine. So these are the classifications of amines. Let's see if we can look at some specific examples. So here are some specific examples here. Here's a CH3 that's bonded to a nitrogen, and it has two hydrogens, so therefore, this is a primary amine. Here's another example. Here's the nitrogen. It's bonded to one alkyl group, in this case a methyl. 
it's bonded to another alkyl group, in this case a methyl, and one hydrogen, so therefore this is a secondary amine. Lastly, let's look at this one. Here's the nitrogen. It's bonded to one methyl group, two methyl groups, and three methyl groups, so therefore this specific amine here is a tertiary amine. There's another classification of amine, and we'll call that the aromatic amines. Aromatic. You may recall aromat aromatic compounds are typically compounds that have the benzene ring. Here it is. So here's the difference, though. If the group that's bonded directly to the nitrogen is a benzene ring, it's now classified as an aromatic amine. Let's look at this one. Here's the benzene ring and it is bonded directly to this nitrogen. So therefore that's an aromatic amine. Of course we know that to be aniline. That's a common name. Here's another type of amine. Here's the nitrogen. Here is the benzene ring that's bonded directly to this nitrogen. So therefore that is an aromatic amine also. It's described as a secondary, a further description. Why? Because here's one alkyl group over here and here is another group. I shouldn't say alkyl group, but that's a group. So here's one group bonded here and here's another group. So that is a secondary amine. Let's look at this one. Here's the nitrogen. But look at this benzene ring. It is not directly bonded to this nitrogen. So therefore, this is not an aromatic amine, but instead what's called an aliphatic amine. Aliphatic here means just it's the groups that are bonded, bond, bonded to the nitrogen are really um, um, alkanes. So this is your typical tertiary amine. Why tertiary? One group, two groups, and all of this now would be three groups bonded. So that makes it a tertiary amine. So you should be able to look at an amine and classify them as primary, secondary, or tertiary. And if there's a benzene ring bonded directly to the nitrogen, you should be able to classify that as an aromatic amine. Here's some more examples of classification. This one is called the heterocyclic amine. Keywords or key aspects of this word. Hetero, different as we know, but cyclic. So we're talking about cyclic amines here. There are two categories. Heterocyclic aliphatic, remember we said aliphatic here, are compounds that have the alkane groups, saturated carbons, no double bonds, no triple bonds. So we have here heterocyclic aliphatic amines, and another one is heterocyclic aromatic amines. Let's see the difference. So this aliphatic here has no double bonds in it. So these are classified as aliphatic amines because here's the nitrogen and it's part of a ring and so therefore it's a heterocyclic aliphatic amine because there are no double bonds here. Here's another example. A nitrogen which is part of the ring and there are no double bonds involved, so therefore it's a hetero because of the nitrogen, it's a cyclic because of the ring, and aliphatic because there are no double bonds here, and amine because of the nitrogen. Let's look over here. Heterocyclic aromatic amines. Aromatic here means that they will have double bonds in the ring. So here's a nitrogen, here's the ring, and here are double bonds in the ring. So therefore this type 
amine is described as a heterocyclic aromatic amine. Here are some more examples, and you may recognize these from your biology courses here. So the main take-home lesson here is you should be able to look at this term here, heterocyclic aromatic amine, break it down, hetero means different, in this case it's a nitrogen, cyclic means a ring, aromatic means that they are double bonds. This term here, same concept, hetero, nitrogen, cyclic, a ring, aliphatic, however, means no double bonds, and of course the means implying that it's a nitrogen. So again, you have different types of amines, and you should be able to classify each as primary, secondary, tertiary, or aromatic, or heterocyclic amine, which could be classified further as aliphatic or aromatic heterocyclic. Okay, amines are widely used in everyday life. Selected examples are shown below. Here is um, Novocaine that you are familiar with whenever we go to the dentist. So let's see if we can identify the means and what type of means are present. Here's the nitrogen here. But this nitrogen is bonded to a benzene ring. So therefore, this functionality right here is your aromatic amine. This functionality here is a nitrogen that's bonded to two ethyl groups and this other group here, so therefore this is a tertiary amine. Here is another one. The nitrogen is part of the ring, so therefore this is your heterocyclic aromatic amine. Heterocyclic aromatic amine both nitrogens, this nitrogen and this nitrogen. Here's this one. This has two hydrogens here and bonded to this group back over here, so therefore this is a primary amine. This molecule here, dopamine, a neurotransmitter, um, has here a NH2, so right away you can recognize that as a primary amine. By the way, this molecule here, as you'll see here, is histamine. You take that whenever you have um, allergies, that type of thing. But they are all amines. Here's another slide with some more examples. And these have been in the news recently because of um, it was suggested earlier for um, um, treatment with um, COVID. But here are the structures. So let's look at this. Let's look at this one first. This nitrogen here is a tertiary amine. Why? Because this nitrogen is bonded to an ethyl group, an ethyl group, and another group all over here. How about this one? This nitrogen here is secondary because it's bonded to one alkyl group, another alkyl group, and a hydrogen. But let's look at it carefully. It's also bonded to this aromatic ring. So further classification of this is it is an aromatic amine. Let's look at this one. This nitrogen here is part of the ring, so it is a heterocyclic aromatic amine. This one here, as you can see, it's going to be secondary. But again, it's also part of this aromatic ring, so it is a aromatic amine, and this one here is a tertiary. Why? Because it is nitrogen that's bonded to one, two, and three groups here. And that's called hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which has been, these drugs have been proven to be an anti-malarial 
drug or drugs. Let's look at the nomenclature of a means. The nomenclature of a means here. You may recall the main importance of nomenclature is that we can communicate the names of new compounds to chemists all over the world because we have a systematic way of naming compounds and chemists. They all know the systematic way of naming compounds called the IUPAC system or the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists. So, first you have to recognize and identify the mean functionality. And here it is. So, the same molecule I've written twice here, but you'll have to start numbering at the end closest to this mean functionality. You can see here that this end, starting here with number one, is closest to the mean so one two three four five six if you start numbering here this gets number four which means that this is incorrect because it is further from the mean the starting end so this is the correct numbering system one two three four five six we know why we're numbering it because the number here will tell us the root name for that amine. So we convert the root name from the alkane by changing the E to an amine so the name becomes alkanamine. So we had six carbons, so which would be hexane. We change this E to the amine and it becomes hexanamine. However, we have to indicate the position of the amine. It's on position number three, so we have to include three as part of the name. Okay? So this E goes to amine. Let's look at naming this molecule. Here's the mean, here's the end that's closest. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So it becomes an hexane mean again. And here we have the mean on carbon number two. Same here. One, two, three, four, and five. So it's a pentane mean this time and it's on carbon number two. That is the mean functionality. So look out for naming a means using the IUPAC name system. How do we name secondary and tertiary amines? Here is the trick, the same naming system. One, two, three, four, five, six. Start at the end closest to the mean functionality. Here's the mean functionality. Now we'll have to determine what's bonded to this nitrogen in addition to the longest chain. What's bonded here is a methyl. A methyl that's bonded to this nitrogen so it becomes N-methyl. Why N-methyl? Because this methyl here is bonded to that nitrogen. So we put an N just to indicate that this methyl is bonded to that nitrogen. The rest of the name becomes the same. 3, because on carbon number 3 is the hexanamine functionality. An example, another example is over here. Here is the N-ethyl, ethyl, because two carbons. And of course, N-ethyl, two, Y2, one, two, three, four, and five. So you can see that this two corresponds to that two. Five means that it's a pentanamine. Let's look at it. Tertiary amine. So here's a nitrogen that has two methyl groups here. So it becomes an NN. 
dimethyl. Notice it's a dimethyl because there are two methyl groups. We have to indicate NN just to emphasize that these two methyl groups here, this di, really belongs to these two ends. And of course, one, two, three, four, five, and six, hexanamine, and the mean functionality is on carbon number two, as indicated here. Same here. Here are here is one methyl group. Here is, is another methyl group. So it's N N dimethyl. And one, two, three, four, five, and six hexanamine. And two, because the amine functionality is bonded to carbon number two. So again, you should be able to. Classify amines as primary, secondary, or tertiary. You should be able to name amines, the IUPAC name of a primary amine, the IUPAC name of a secondary amine, and the IUPAC name of a tertiary amine. Let's look at branched amines right here. So here's a branch, here's the longest chain, here's the mean functionality. So we start numbering not at the end closest to the branch, but at the end closest to the mean functionality. That takes priority over branching. So we start here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, hexanamine. As you can see here, that's hexanamine. And on position number three is the amine functionality. But, and now the branch, which is a methyl, is on carbon number five. So it becomes a five methyl, three hexanamine. Just another example before we leave this topic here of nomenclature. Here is the mean functionality. So we start numbering at the end closest to that mean and not at the branch, just to emphasize, not at the end closest to the branch, but at the end closest to the mean functionality. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's hexane. We change it to hexanamine, as shown here. Three, because the mean functionality is on carbon number three. So that's why we put a three here. And then we have one methyl, two methyls, bonded to carbons number four and five. So it becomes four, five. Don't forget the dye dimethyl for two methyls, um, three hexanamine. So that is the systematic way, the IUPAC naming system for amines. Let us look at the aromatic amines here. The simplest aromatic amine, as we pointed out earlier, is bonded to the benzene ring with the amine. And of course, as we have seen before, the common name for that becomes aniline. Aniline. So, in terms of naming anilines, we identify this as carbon number one. So, if we have a group bonded to the ring, such as here, this is one, two, three, and four. So, this is four nitro. Aniline. Let's not worry too much about the P and the M. Just go by the numbers. Here's another example. One, two, three. Remember, you go in the direction of the branch to get the lowest possible number combination. So this becomes three methyl, because that's a methyl. And of course, 
aniline because here is the aniline group. So again, that's how we'll name our aromatic amines. Physical properties. As we mentioned earlier, physical properties are any measurable or observable characteristics of uh, molecules, compounds. Amines, one of the observable characteristics of um, amines is the odor. They have very sharp, penetrating, pungent odor. If we should open a bottle of amine in the lab, you will know that it's open because you can smell, smell it. Trimethylamine is an example that has a pungent odor and that of rotten fish. So you don't want to keep a fish sitting around too long to get it rotten so you can detect the odor. But if it's sitting around for a long time, you will have a very foul, pungent odor. And that's based on the um, degradation of the amino acids and the protein that's part of that to form trimethylamine and that has the pungent odor. Here are two more. 1,2-butadiene, here's the amine, this has two amines bonded to the molecule and here's another one, two amines bonded to the, to the molecule and these are very pungent smelling compounds, again decaying proteins and, 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 um, and um, amino acids will give off um, this type odor. Very pungent, can't miss it. Another aspect, physical property of amines is that of hydrogen bonding. They are polar molecules. They are polar molecules. And you may recall a polar molecule is one that has a covalent bond where two atoms are of different electronegativities. They're bonded to atoms on the periodic table uh, on different, um, um, different regions of the periodic table. So here's an example. Nitrogen is bonded to hydrogen. This bond here is a polar covalent bond because nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So look at your periodic table. You'll see that nitrogen is to the right on the column 5 and hydrogen is to the left on the column 1. And remember the most electronegative atom is fluorine by definition to the right, extreme right. So therefore nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen which means that these electrons here in this covalent bond is closer to the nitrogen making it partially negative as shown here. Which means that this hydrogen is partially positive. So if we have another molecule of an amine that has a hydrogen bonded to the nitrogen, this is partially positive and this is partially negative. As you know, opposite charges will attract, even opposite partial charges will attract. So here is an attraction right here between the negative nitrogen and the positive hydrogen of two molecules. We call this intermolecular attraction. And since it involves hydrogens that are bonded to the electronegative nitrogen, it's known as hydrogen bonding. These are called intermolecular attractions. Very strong. Very strong. Notice that tertiary amines, they do not have a hydrogen bonded to the nitrogen. So in other words, we have here nitrogen, which is bonded to an alkyl group, which is bonded to another alkyl group, and to another alkyl group, and two electrons. There are no hydrogen, so therefore this cannot be involved in an intermolecular hydrogen bonding. Let's see the effect of hydrogen bonding between primary and secondary amines. As, as we mentioned, 
The hydrogen bonding are very important in determining the boiling points of liquids because the hydrogen bonding must be broken so that the individual molecules can go from the liquid phase into the gaseous phase. Here is an aspect of importance, however. Since nitrogen is to the left of oxygen, it means that the hydrogen that's formed between hydrogen and nitrogen, this hydrogen bond here is weaker than this hydrogen that bond that's formed between hydrogen and oxygen. Let me just say that again, just for emphasis. I'll say it differently. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. How do we know that? Because oxygen is to the right of nitrogen on the periodic table. So get your periodic table out and find oxygen. You will see that it's to the right, very close to fluorine. Whereas nitrogen is to the left, much further from the most electronegative atom, fluorine. So therefore, the OH bond here is stronger than the NH hydrogen bond. The effect is, as we can see here, it will require more energy to break the OH hydrogen bond compared to the NH hydrogen bond. So let's look at these compounds here. Methylamine and methanol, they have just about the same molecular weight. So based on molecular mass, you'd expect it to have the same boiling point because of the amount of energy required to take it from the liquid phase into the vapor phase. However, you can see that the boiling point of methylamine is minus 6.3 and that of methanol is 65, much, much higher. Why? Because the hydrogen bonding here between two molecules of methanol is much stronger than the hydrogen bonding here between two molecules of methylamine. So, the bottom line is that the boiling point of alcohols are much higher than the boiling point of means of similar molecular weight because the hydrogen bonding for alcohols are much stronger, let me write it here, than that of means which are weaker. <coughs> okay, so let's look at another property, the solubility in water. So amines are typically very soluble in water. Why? Because of the hydrogen bonding capability to water. Because remember, water is a polar molecule. So water is H2O polar molecule, oxygen is electronegative, partially negative, hydrogen here is partially positive, so an amine that has a nitrogen and an H and an R and, and let's put another H here, can form hydrogen bonding to water, so it's soluble. This is true for low molecular weights mean. So if here R is a methyl group here, that's very soluble in water. If it's um, an ethyl group, C2H5, very, very soluble. But if the molecular weight of the mean is pretty high, then it becomes insoluble because of the large amount of CH or carbon that's a part of the molecule. So again, so for low molecular amines, soluble in water, for amines that have higher molecular weight, they are moderately soluble and sometimes even insoluble if it gets too large. You'll see the consequence of that later on when we look at some pharmaceutical compounds that are very large and we would predict to be insoluble in water. So we have to find a way to get it soluble in water. 
So let us now concentrate on the reactions. The reactions of a means. We'll just look at one type reaction, and that is a means or bases. Not strong bases, but they are bases, considered weak bases. Remember, by definition, a base is an electron pair donor. Here's an electron pair. Another aspect, uh, another definition is a base is a proton acceptor. Remember, a proton is H plus. I'll just write it here. So a base is a proton acceptor. So let's look at this reaction. Methylamine. It's a base. HCl, of course, as you can see from just the name of this molecule, it is an acid. So, if there's a reaction, a base will react with an acid. Since a acid is a proton donor, did I say that wrong? An acid is a proton donor. So let me correct that if I said it wrong. So an acid is a proton donor and base is a proton acceptor. Okay, so here's the acid, a proton donor, here's the proton. A base is a proton acceptor, so in fact this base will react and accept this H and here it is. So therefore, this is the salt. It's called an ammonium salt. And this is the product of an acid-base reaction. So once again, just to make sure, here is the base, which is defined as a proton acceptor. A proton is H+. Plus. So if this base accepts this H, as shown here, it will give us this as the product. Notice the Cl here just comes along as the anion. As, we, as we'll see here, if there are four atoms bonded to nitrogen, so here's nitrogen, which has one, two, three, and four, it is no longer classified as an amine, but as an ammonium salt an ammonium group. So, therefore it acquires a charge of positive one. Here's a positive one. And as you know, molecules are neutral. So if we have a positive charge here, it has to have a negative charge, which is called the anion, and it's coming from the acid. So let us see if we can apply that here. So here are some examples of the ammonium salt. So here's the nitrogen. It's bonded to one, two, three, and four groups. As I said earlier, a means are bonded to three groups. But if the nitrogen is bonded to four groups, it becomes an ammonium salt, as shown here, which has a positive charge. And, of course, that makes it the cation. And this would be the anion. So that makes it a neutral molecule. Same here. This, of course, in terms of naming it, this is an ethyl. This is an ethyl. So it's a diethyl, as shown here. Ammonium for this. And iodide here is for that. Let's look at this one. This is an ethyl and an ethyl. So it's a di... I said that wrong. This is a methyl. Let me write it. And this is a methyl. So it becomes a dimethyl as shown here. And it's a di because of one and two methyl groups, ammonium, because it's a nitrogen bonded to four groups, has a positive charge, and a bromide, because here's the anion, bromide. 
Okay, let's look at a benefit here of the acid-base reaction. So, imagine you went into the lab and you accidentally mixed cyclohexanol with cyclohexylamine and you wanted to separate them back out. So just imagine you had a beaker and it's a solution now of cyclohexylamine and cyclohexanol. How do you separate them out? You can use the aspect of acid-base reactions. So if you mix this mixture here with HCl, since this is a base, it will react with the HCl to give us the ammonium salt. I keep emphasizing ammonium salt. Why? Because ammonium salt just by the name salt, it implies that it is water soluble. So this is now water soluble and you can extract it into a water medium. This is not basic, so it is no reaction and this is now an organic molecule which is insoluble in water and only organic solvent. That means you can extract it into a organic medium. So this is utilizing the aspect of amines being basic and can react with an acid to form a soluble salt, which is soluble in water. So we can take advantage of that solubility of salts based on the biological system. So let's look at this. If we have an amine here. And this is, um, as you recognize, this is um, an anesthetic here. Notice it's pretty large. It's an amine, a primary amine, of course. Pretty large. So you'd expect this to be insoluble in water. And to be even more specific, insoluble in the biological aqu aqueous environment. So how do we get this into the body and making sure that it's soluble and can do its job? Reacting it with HCl and converting it into the ammonium salt which makes it water soluble and it has biological benefits now because it is water soluble. Another example is right here. As shown here, the biological blood pH is 7.4. So if we can convert these drugs here, the dopamine, into the salt here. Of course, there is an X minus here, probably the hydrochloride, the Cl minus. We have here a salt that is water soluble compared to dopamine which more than likely based on the size of this amine or the molecular weight of that amine it would not be water soluble but this one is water soluble because of being a salt. So when you go to the drugstore and, and, and you pick up your pharmaceutical um, compound if you look at them, especially if they're amines, you will see that they are sold primarily or mostly as a hydrochloride because it's now converting the amine into the salt. That serves a couple of benefits here. As I said, it's water soluble. Number two, if it's converted to the salt, the odor is not as pungent as if it were the amine itself. So it serves two purpose, purposes of converting it into the salt. Here's another one, Novocaine, local anesthetic. As you can see, this is a pretty large molecule here. Here's the amine, tertiary amine, as you can imagine here. So it's, it's kind of a very insoluble because it does not even have a hydrogen bonded to the nitrogen to make it um, to carry out hydrogen bond into water. But if it's mixed in HCl, we have the salt. So it's now sold as a hydrochloride salt. 
so it can be of biological benefit. So let's see if we can conclude by applying what we have learned in this lecture. So let's see if we can complete the acid-base reactions here and give the name of the salt product. So here is the reaction, here is the acid. How do we know it's the acid? Because it's H bonded to very electronegative Cl, HCl. So this is the acid. And this is the base because of the nitrogen here. So this is the base. So we need to identify the acid and the base. And we need to identify the nitrogen of the acid. Because we have said earlier that a base is a proton acceptor. So in the product over here, we'd expect to have this plus the hydrogen bonded to this nitrogen. It, this, the, the answer is on the next slide, but we're just reasoning this out here. So let's look at B. Here is the nitrogen here, and this is a heterocyclic aromatic amine, but it still has a pair of electrons here. Here is the acid. Of course, you may recognize this to be acetic acid. Here is the acidic hydrogen or the proton. Here is the base. So we'd expect after the reaction is done, this hydrogen will be bonded to this nitrogen to form the salt. So let's see what's the answer. So here we go. So here's the HCl, here's the H, here's the nitrogen. So this H is bonded to this nitrogen as shown here. So it's now NH2 instead of NH. The Cl becomes the N ion, so it's Cl minus. The ammonium ion is a plus and it's now named as di ethyl, why ethyl, two ethyl groups here. How do we know? Because here's a two. And ammonium, why ammonium? Because of the positive charge. Chloride, because of the chloride anion. Here's this one. This molecule is a little tricky. This is called pyridine. So this is now called the pyridinium and the acetate here is from the acetic acid. So here is the acetic acid here with the hydrogen which is the acidic hydrogen. This hydrogen is now bonded to this nitrogen as shown here. So what's left behind is the acetate as shown right here. So the name of this is pyridinium acetate. So that's how you predict the product of an acid-base reaction. I just want to remind you again, don't forget your formal charge for the salt. The ammonium group has four bonds to the nitrogen. If you have four bonds to the nitrogen, it's a plus one. I'll circle that just to let you know that it is a positive charge. Okay, yeah, this is the end of the lecture for me.